So we're trying to get electricity out of these spontaneous chemical reactions. We know they need to be a redox reaction, and we're going to see the apparatus that, that can do this. They're called voltaic cells or galvanic cells. So let's look at this specific reaction, and I'll go over here to the computer screen and we'll walk through it. This is a very typical redox reaction. What's happening here? Well, the copper is losing electrons, so it is oxidized. The silver is gaining those electrons, and there's two electrons transferred in this reaction. Now, if we went and we just took a piece of copper metal and plopped it down into a solution of silver ions, okay, this would happen, and this would happen right at the interface between the two items. So here's a picture of that. So this is a solution that has silver ions floating around in it, okay, and this is a piece of copper metal. We can see that it's got that typical copper color. We're going to place that down into that test tube and wait a while. Notice what happens here. This is changing colors because copper ions are greenish blue in color. And you're going to see flakes forming on here. That is actually solid silver that is plating out onto that copper. If there's enough copper um, silver ions in solution, we could dissolve all of that copper away. Now, if we do that right there like that, the electrons are transferring right here at the interface between these two guys, right? Right there as the uh, reaction takes place. And you cannot get any electricity out of that. In order to have electricity, you have to have the flow of electrons. And there's no flow of electrons. They're just transferring right there. So along comes, um, oops, I need to do some erasing. Um, what we'll have to do is force those electrons in order to transfer. They have to travel through a wire in order to get from one place to the other instead of happening right there at that interface, OK? So it's the galvanic cell or the voltaic cell, whichever way you want to go with it, that will take a, a reaction like this one and allow it to occur spontaneously, but make the electrons flow through a wire to do the transfer. So we're going to look at this, this setup here, okay? What I have is both substances, both copper, the solid, and copper, the ion, on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, I have both the silver, the solid, and the silver, the ions and solution around it, okay? What's going to happen is the electrons are going to leave the copper. Remember, that was our overall reaction. I probably should write that overall reaction up here. The copper started as a solid. And that was aqueous going to copper 2 plus aqueous plus silver solid, and that was a 2. So here, the copper is turning into copper 2 plus in this side of the container over here on the left. So the copper is turning into copper 2 plus. Now, it can't do that without losing electrons. Those two electrons are flowing through this wire. And they're coming over here into the silver. The silver is picking up those electrons and plating out onto here. So as time goes by, this electrode is getting heavier. It's just gaining mass because we are forming the silver solid. Over here, this guy is losing mass because it is turning into the copper ions. Now let's learn some language that's going on here. Number one, on the left-hand side of this is the anode. The anode is where oxidation occurs. Remember, loss of electrons. Oxidation occurs at the anode. Now this is how I remember that. Anode starts with an A and oxidation starts with an A, all right? We label the anode negatively charged because electrons are coming out of it. And so that's why we label it that. Now, those electrons are flowing through a voltmeter, which we'll talk about the voltage of this. And that's only there to measure it. It's not a required piece. Coming over here, and on the right-hand side of this image, we've got the cathode, OK? At the cathode is where reduction takes place. 
and handily, they both start with consonants, okay? Now, you might have some other device that you could do to remember that. The electrons are pumping down into there, going away from you, and they label that positively charged. So we have our anode and we have our cathode. Another very important piece that this reaction will not take place without it is the salt bridge. Now the salt bridge has got to contain, it says, an inert electrolyte. Inert means it cannot get involved in the reaction because it's going to flow possibly in and out of here. Why is that necessary? Well, we've got to keep the balances charged, the charges balanced on either side. So let me make this go away for just a moment. Um, if we are turn, forming Cu2+, then we are getting positive charges into this beaker that weren't there before. Well, you can't have a positive charge without a negative charge coming in. So the nitrate ions will flow into here, and this porous plug allows those ions to flow in without having the liquid um, be transferred. It's as simple as a piece of cotton will do it to allow the migration of the ions through there. On the right-hand side, the silver ions are plating out. So we're losing cations on the right-hand side. If we're losing cations, we must either have anions leave or we could have cations flow into here. Regardless, that salt bridge, you remove it and nothing can happen. All right, so that's our salt bridge. I do have the voltmeter highlighted. I told you this is not a necessary part of it, but we can measure um, by way of this the energy of the transfer of those electrons across the wire. And we'll talk a lot about voltage as we go. All right, so those are the components of this. Now, standard form is to put the anode on the left when you draw a galvanic cell and the cathode on the right. That is standard. And let's see, one last thing I want to write on here are the half reactions that are occurring at both the anode and at the cathode. So at the anode, and you know what? I want to go to the board for this because I need to write it out. At the anode, okay, what's happening there? The copper solid is turning into, sorry, <laughs> it's not going to have a charge if it's the solid. The copper solid is turning into copper 2 plus and it's losing two electrons. And at the cathode, the silver ions are gaining electrons to turn into silver solid. Now, you can't have those two half reactions added together unless the number of electrons gained and lost are the same. So we will put twos across here, and that's why the original reaction that I wrote had two silvers. Okay, we have two electrons transferred in order for this reaction to take place. So the net equation is the same whether they were touching each other and transferring the electrons right there in the test tube, or you set up this galvanic cell and force those electrons to transfer across the wire in order to get from one place to the other. All right, so the electrons will always flow from the anode because it's losing the electrons to the cathode because the cathode is gaining electrons. And the reason they do this is, has to do with the potential energy. It's basically, we talked about acid-base reactions being a battle of the proton. Who wants the proton? Who's going to give the proton? Um, anode and cathode is about who wants those electrons and who doesn't. Most metals like to be cations, for example. Who wants to be a cation worse? Well, the copper wants to be a cation worse. It is more easy for it to lose electrons than it is for silver to lose electrons. Or um, it is, so the copper is forcing, in a way, its electrons onto the silver because of this cell potential. When we talk about cell potential, we talk about it with a lot of different language. I'm not sure why we have so many different things, but if you're using other resources to help you study, these are some terminology that you will run across. 
I used to call it cell potential, but it could be called cell voltage. It could be called electromotive force. It could be abbreviated EMF, and that's for electromotive force. It could be abbreviated with the symbol E, and it's usually italicized. And then we've got what I say I usually use, which is cell potential. Those all mean the same thing, okay? Every last one of them are meaning this. So this is the difference in, it's kind of like, you know, if you put a ball up on the top of a hill or a rock and let it roll down, it is going to a lower potential. That's what drives the, the ball from rolling down the hill. The electrons are going to a lower energy state by um, this difference in cell potential. And this is a little connection. We said we could get energy out of this electron flow. Once we start measuring voltage, we can make a calculation about how much energy those electrons are giving. The joules divided by the charge, coulombs is in charge, coulombs is the abbreviation C there. That's the charge of the electrons that flow. So if you have a certain number of electrons that are flowing and you know the joules and you divide by the total charge that passes through there, you will have the voltage, and that is the cell potential. Another thing that we talk about when we're talking about electricity, and I just want you to get a feel for the difference in these things, is the other one is current. So we can talk about voltage or we can talk about current. Current is measured in amperes, and that's abbreviated with an A or AMP, either one. Current is basically the, if you think about it, it's how, how, what's the rate of flow, okay? If you think about the difference between a meandering stream versus a raging river, one is flowing very fast and one is uh, flowing s more slowly. Current in electricity is along those lines as far as we think, the rate that the electrons are flowing through the wire. So here's a wire, if, if they're going and there's not that many that are flowing in a certain amount of time, that would be a slow, like there's not a whole lot of water passing through the stream during a certain amount of time. Um, but if you have a lot of electrons passing through the wire in a certain amount of time, that would be a higher current. Amps is coulombs, that's the charge over time. The electrons are carrying a charge, so the number of electrons will give you the current, I mean, yeah, the, I'm sorry, the coulombs, divided by the time. So it's, it's a rate, it is a speed, basically, of those electrons. It's a way of measuring that, okay? Um, now, this is not numbers that you need to memorize, but I want to remind you what a coulomb is. A coulomb is, a, um, is the SI unit for charge, okay? And one measly electron has that tiny amount of coulombs. So an amp, you've got to have, in order to have one amp, you have to have a whole lot of electrons flowing in one second. So that gives you a feel of what, what the magnitude of those electrons are as we carry it. So we've got voltage, which is cell potential. We've got amps, which is a measure of the current of the electrons. We won't do anything with amps at this time. We'll stay in the world of voltage um, as we go through the lessons here at the beginning of this chapter. All right, it would be just a real pain to have to always draw this picture out anytime we wanted to talk about this cell. So we need to be able to represent this cell using a diagram, okay? It's a, uh, it is a way of showing everything that's on there in a very systematic way. The way you do this is you start with the anode. So I'm gonna start right here, and what is the anode? The anode is copper, and it's a solid. So I'm gonna be pretty specific there. Then what we'll go is, and we're gonna work our way through here, through the salt bridge, and finish at the cathode. Every time you change phases, you want to, and there's my cathode, every time you change phases, you, you use a single line, vertical line. So I am, and I'm gonna erase all this so I can keep track of it here, I am going from the copper my starting point, I'm going into the solution next. So the next thing I have is a phase boundary, and I have copper, and it's the ion now. So I get specific about it. I say it's aqueous, because it's dissolved in water. And if I know, I can tell its concentration right after that. And it tells me here that it's a one molar solution. Now I'm leaving this 
area and I'm going into the salt bridge. Salt bridges are represented with a double line like that. And then we exit the salt bridge and we're going into solution again. And the solution is silver ions, okay? They are in solution water. And again, it tells me its concentration so I can include that. I leave that boundary and finish at the cathode by putting a straight line and say this is silver solid. So I have started at the cathode, gone through the salt bridge and finished I said cathode, I think. I started at the anode, went through the salt bridge, and ended up at the cathode. All right, so what we're going to do next is learn how to calculate what it, and actually we're not going to calculate it yet. We're going to talk about something called um, standard electrode potential. We'll work on values, and we're going to see tables full of electrode potentials as we move on down. We need to know what it is first. So that's up next.